she works for Nixon Peabody um, in DC. Uh, and so she's an attorney with that firm and obviously in the trade industry. But um, go ahead, Rachel, just go ahead and let us yeah. know a little bit more about who you are and what, what you guys do there and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. So um, I'm a partner with Nixon Peabody. We're an AMLA 100 law firm with offices around the country and the world. Um, I am on, on our cross-border risks team. It's a really unique team that not a lot of other practices have. Um, we fall in our government investigations and white collar section. Um, but we are comprised of um, former DHS officials. Uh, so my, my my other partners on my team are former acting ICE director, former acting general counsel, um, former uh, HF Homeland Security investigation special agents in charge. Uh, so we really kind of span the gamut of Homeland Security. Um, I my my personal background. I was at DHS for seven years, um, focusing on immigration policy, also working in headquarters on. Um, benefits, uh, enforcement, border security, and trade issues. Um, in private practice, uh, you know, I've um, expanded my expertise even more so in the homeland security space. Um, and really, folks come to us when they have, uh, when they need somebody to fix a problem, right? So, we well, that's that's the one thing with most attorneys <laughs> is that when people are calling for an attorney. Uh, at that point, there is an issue usually, and somebody's <laughs> got to be the proverbial pooper scooper at the end of a parade to clean it all up, right? And that's like, there you go. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I love all of our compliance-minded clients. I, I appreciate companies doing the right setup from the start. It's way cheaper for them. Uh, they don't have to call me as much, um, but we are also, you know, we also get brought in to do as you say, um, to, to kind of fix issues that have gone awry, help people navigate really difficult circumstances. So the ultimate responsibility that as they're, you know, if you've got foreign nationals in your company and, and things of that nature, where would DHS generally look at to say, here is where the buck stops. I mean, and I, yeah, we can always say the CEO of the company, but I mean, in general of a big company and, and, and whatnot, where does DHS, would they, you know, say, okay, we're holding you accountable or you should have had some policies in that? Yeah. I mean, look, they're going to go after the company generally, and it could impact your ability to continue sponsoring foreign nationals. It could impact your ability to participate in various trade programs or licensing programs, and it could impact your, and then they could, you know, they could ultimately, depending upon what types of issues they're looking into, they could find people in your management supply chain responsible, uh, particularly for um, depending on, you know, depending on what the issue is, they could find them irresponsible, you know, responsible for fraudulent activity, for I-9 violations, for um, if they're here and they're not here on the right types of visas, for, you know, unlawful work authorization. Um, if you're sharing information that you shouldn't be sharing with that foreign national, right, you're looking at potential criminal consequences. And those could apply to, sure, it could apply to the top, but sometimes the top has a really good paper trail that, you know, they weren't paying attention, even though they were supposed to. But you have a manager who has been trained on these issues, but hasn't been carefully watching what's going on in the company. That manager could be liable for those, you know, for, for those violations. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, we see a criminal, you know, we don't see, uh, uh, you know, criminal um, allegations being made absent, you know, pretty serious misconduct. Uh, so, so you know, this isn't, you know, we're, it's very unlikely this is just a, a, a mistake, right? Um, mistakes are, are understandable and generally you'll be subject to some type of civil violation, you know, maybe a fine, you know, a hand slap, maybe you have to deregister or whatever for a couple of years. Criminal violations tend to rise to a higher level and require some type of knowledge, some type of, you know, put, you know, actively, actively, you know, uh, 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 closing your eyes. Right. Is there an effort from the Chinese companies? 
that are either trying to circumvent certain things to get their hands on U.S. technology and or is are there efforts that Chinese companies are working on behalf of the Chinese government to do and conduct espionage type activities? I think what the government is seeing is, um, you know, companies actively engaging in or, or what they believe is happening is companies actively engaging in fraudulent activity to hide the source of their of their goods in the supply chain um, and to, to hide that forced labor. So in looking at that, let me ask then from what you're dealing with, I guess, uh, with your clients and all that, the end result, what activities do you recommend that leadership should take to prevent themselves their companies from get going awry. What should they be meeting with certain departments? Should they be asking certain questions? And if so, you know, to who, what, what, what do you, what do you want them to do to show due diligence versus something that would be in late, you know, earlier on could be considered negligence or gross negligence. Cause you're a small shop doesn't mean, you know, these, these issues don't apply to you. Um, If you are looking, you know, if some, if a price seems too good to be true, there's probably a reason for it. Um, And, and you should be looking at what, you know, what the company is that you are, you are sourcing your product from. (laughs) 